Question. Why does bacon smell so good? The smell of sizzling bacon cooking in a pan is easily one of the most unmistakable aromas in the world of food. All sorts of foods smell great when they're cooking, but something about the scent of crispy bacon is extra special. So special, in fact, that all sorts of strange products have popped up over the years trying to capture the smell. From scented candles all the way to soaps and colognes that make you smell like bacon. Bacon starts to smell good almost from the moment it touches the hot pan. First, the strips of bacon meat undergo a special kind of chemical reaction with a fancy name known as the Maillard reaction. That's what causes food to turn brown and gives it more flavor when it's heated up. It's what makes toast darker and more delicious and gives cooked meat that classic grilled look. As bacon goes through the Maillard reaction and the fats in the meat melt, the acids in the meat heat up and react with the sugars used to give it more flavor, causing the bacon to turn brown and crispy and smell as delicious as it sounds sizzling in the pan. As the bacon continues to cook, more and more compounds are released into the air, which is what causes that unmistakable scent. Okay, so that's how bacon gets its smell, but what makes it unique? And more importantly, why do people seem to love it so much more than normal? Like any other food going through the Maillard reaction, bacon comes out the other side with its own distinct aroma, with its own distinct chemical makeup. According to experts, bacon seems to have just the right combination of these chemicals to make for that extra delicious smell. Kind of like a combination of colors that happen to mix to make a beautiful shade. There's one more psychological reason why we love the smell of cooking bacon so much. It has a ton of salt and a ton of fat in it, which are two things you need to eat to survive, and two things our ancient ancestors would have considered a luxurious treat. But since salty, fatty meat can make you sick if you eat it raw, humans learned somewhere along the way that cooked meat was safer, and our brain and body started to crave the smell of cooked meat. Now, let's go have some nice, crispy bacon. Ugh, now I'm hungry. Who invented pizza? As you might imagine, pizza has a long history, and it took a long time for pizza to develop into the pie we know today. Ancient flatbreads covered in toppings are probably the oldest known ancestor of the modern pizza pie, and people have been eating flatbreads with toppings like oil, spices, and cheese for as long as we've been keeping records. Okay, so that's pizza's origin story, but when did that ancient flatbread transform into the pizza pies we know today? That credit is traditionally given to the Italian city of Naples, where people have been eating pizzas since at least the 1500s. It was a coastal city chock full of blue-collar workers who needed something cheap, quick, and tasty to eat. The people of Naples, or Neapolitans as they're called, turned to our ancient treat, the flatbread. They added their own toppings like tomatoes, cheese, olive oils, garlic, and even anchovies. These earliest versions of the pizza were sold by street vendors and were eaten for any meal. For several decades, pizza remained nothing more than a local favorite of the Neapolitans. Until 1861, when Italy officially became a country, bringing together a bunch of regions under one ruler. As part of this process, the king and queen decided to stop by different regions around the country, including the city of Naples, which they visited in 1889. This is where our story enters the realm of legend. The story goes that the dynastic duo had become bored of all the classy French cuisine they were eating as they toured the country. So they decided to just order some local pizzas instead of having a big fancy meal. They apparently ate several different pies and loved them all. The queen especially loved a specific version, a pizza pie topped with soft mozzarella cheese, red tomatoes, and green basil. If that sounds familiar, it's because we still call that a margarita pizza today. Now, whether or not this bit of historical pizza binging ever happened, it's clear that pizza as we know it got its start in Naples around this time, 
But if the king and queen did have a slice, it didn't start an overnight sensation across Italy. Pizza didn't start to gain its worldwide popularity until the 1940s and 50s, when Italian immigrants from cities like Naples started living, working, and opening restaurants in countries like France, Spain, England, and, of course, the United States. At first, pizza places owned by Italian immigrants started to pop up that were just meant to give other immigrants a quick, cheap, and delicious taste of home. But before long, word spread, and Italians and non-Italians alike were chowing down on pizza. And ever since, pizza has remained one of the most popular foods all around the globe. Depending on where you are, you can find pizzas with just about any toppings you can imagine. How is chocolate made? Turns out, it's quite the process to make chocolate. Those sweet treats start out as cocoa beans growing on a tree. These beans are actually the seeds of the cocoa tree. The pods, called chorelles, can be all different colors, from bright yellow to deep purple. They have about 20 to 60 seeds inside, each about an inch long and covered in a sticky white pulp. The very first step in making chocolate is to carefully scoop out those sticky beans, cover them with banana leaves, then put them inside shallow boxes so they can ferment. Fermentation is a natural chemical reaction where yeast or bacteria breaks down the sugar and turns it into something more acidic, like vinegar. For the cocoa beans, it's the sticky white pulp that starts to ferment. This can take anywhere from three to nine days. Once the beans fully transform to a dark brown color, they're spread out on mats and left in the sun to dry out. This takes between a few days and a few weeks. Once they're nice and dry, the dried and fermented beans are packed into sacks and shipped off to chocolate factories around the world. At the factory, the beans first get roasted. This helps kill off any leftover bacteria and also helps to develop the flavor, bringing out the special chocolatey smell and taste even more. After roasting, the bean is cracked open by a machine and the cocoa nibs are removed. Powerful fans blow away all the lighter shell pieces, leaving just the pure pieces of cocoa behind. Those nibs are then ground into a deep, dark brown paste called cocoa mass that smells great and tastes a bit like super buttery, bitter chocolate. Some of this cocoa mass is kept for later. The rest is pressed in a machine that squeezes all the cocoa butter out of the paste, leaving behind a flat, dry cake that's ground into a powder like you might use in hot chocolate. The hunk of cocoa mass from before is mixed with the cocoa butter that was squeezed out. Then plenty of sugar is added. Sometimes other ingredients are thrown in too, like milk, vanilla, nuts, or other flavors. The chocolate blend is then sent through rollers to work out impurities and make the chocolate as perfectly smooth as possible. Finally, the concoction is heated and cooled over and over in a special process called tempering that keeps the chocolate looking nice as it dries into its final form. Whew, that's a lot of steps. It turns out that making chocolate is, well, kinda hard. Eating it, on the other hand, well, that's the easy part. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Let's start with a brief history of the hot dog. The hot dog we know and love today was originally popularized by a Polish immigrant to the U.S. named Nathan Handwerker. He opened a hot dog stand on Coney Island in New York City, charging just five cents per dog. His grilled hot dogs were a smash hit. Before long, Nathan's famous hot dogs were known across the country. They were so popular, in fact, that Eleanor Roosevelt served grilled hot dogs at a picnic for King George VI of England and his queen. Okay, so that's how hot dogs became a classic all-American food, but that doesn't actually answer the question. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Well, it all depends on who you ask. According to the National Hot Dog and Sausage Council, which is a real thing, hot dogs are not a sandwich. Then what is it, you might ask? According to the council, a hot dog is an exclamation of joy, a food, 
a verb that describes showing off and even an emoji. It is truly a category unto its own. Well, if that answer doesn't satisfy you, then good. It's an unsatisfying answer. But luckily, there are other authorities out there willing to take a stronger stance. Merriam-Webster Dictionary said, in no uncertain terms, that a hot dog is a sandwich. Here's why. Since the actual definition of a sandwich is two or more slices of bread or a split roll having a filling in between, a hot dog absolutely qualifies. So, I guess that settles it once and for all. A hot dog is, in fact, a sandwich. Well, congratulations, everyone. We did it. Is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? In order to answer this ageless argument, we're gonna need to set a few things straight. Namely, what exactly is a fruit and a vegetable? According to plant scientists, a fruit is something that grows from a fertilized flower and carries the plant's seeds. That makes apples, bananas, pineapples, peaches, apricots, melons, and mangoes all fruit. But it also means that squash, pumpkins, cucumbers, peppers, eggplants, avocados, and yes, tomatoes are fruit too. That's right, tomatoes aren't the only fruit disguised as a vegetable. Scientifically, a vegetable is any part of a plant you can eat that isn't a fruit. That means leaves like lettuce, cabbage, spinach, and kale, stems like celery, asparagus, and rhubarb, flowers like broccoli, and all the stuff underground like carrots, beets, onions, and potatoes are all vegetables. So there you have it. According to science, tomatoes are a fruit. But that might leave you wondering, why all the debate? If the science is in, why do some people say they're vegetables? Well, as average produce-eating non-scientists, we think of fruit as the edible part of a plant that have a sweet or juicy flavor, and vegetables as everything else with a savory, green or earthy flavor. So tomatoes might technically be a fruit, but they fit our cultural definition of a vegetable. As if that didn't add enough confusion to the equation, the Supreme Court of the United States decided to weigh in on the matter back in 1893. A tomato importer tried to avoid the 10% tax on foreign vegetables by arguing that, scientifically, tomatoes were in fact a fruit, and therefore couldn't be taxed as a foreign vegetable. After deliberating, the Supreme Court decided that the tomato was, in fact, a vegetable. Their argument was that since tomatoes are usually served as a part of dinner instead of dessert, they should be considered a vegetable. That ruling only applies to US tax law though, so while the answer remains a little murky, we can say with absolute scientific certainty that tomatoes are a fruit. They just seem like a vegetable in literally every way. <laughs> That's not confusing, right? Why does Swiss cheese have holes? Those big holes in your Swiss cheese are called eyes by cheesemakers and might look like they were chewed out by a hungry mouse, but the truth is, those holes aren't mouse-made. They're not even man-made. No one actually knew why Swiss cheese had its eyes. It was a bit of a cheesy mystery. But all of that changed in 1912 when an American chemist published his theory behind what was causing those holes. Swiss cheese, like all other cheeses, needs bacteria to ferment or break down the milk. The type of cheese is decided by the type of milk and bacteria used. For Swiss, cheesemakers use Propionibacterium freudenreichi. The bacteria produces carbon dioxide, which slowly starts to build up inside the cheese. Since Swiss is made at warm temperatures, the cheese starts super soft. As the bacteria grows and releases more and more carbon dioxide, the buildup of gas makes round pockets of air inside the cheese, a lot like blowing up a balloon. As the cheese continues to age and cool down, the bubbles harden into place inside the hunks of cheese, giving Swiss its eyes. And just like that, the great Swiss cheese mystery seemed to be solved until the 1990s, when scientists started to suspect that the old bacteria theory didn't quite add up. The problem was, cheesemakers in Europe began to notice that their Swiss cheeses were starting to have fewer and fewer holes, yet they hadn't changed anything about the bacteria in the cheesemaking process. 
That meant something else must have been causing those iconic holes. And just like that, the mystery was back on. It was another 20 or so years before the researchers in Switzerland discovered the answer once and for all. Hey, it turns out the carbon dioxide bubbles weren't just forming because the cheese was soft, they were forming around little bits of hay that got stuck in the cheese through milk buckets used by cheesemakers all over Europe. But what changed in the 1990s? Why did the cheese start to go blind and lose its eyes? Cheesemakers modernized to processing centers and milking machines. This meant the much needed hay was accidentally cut out of the Swiss cheese making process. Lucky for us, scientists and cheesemakers have finally solved the mystery for good, allowing them to add in the right particles to their milk so it makes perfect Swiss cheese with plenty of those telltale holes. So next time you see a slice of cheese with holes in it, remember, it actually took tons of time and effort to keep your Swiss cheese chock full of those big, beautiful eyes. So enjoy, and don't forget to share what's really inside of a hot dog. In 1906, Upton Sinclair published a book called The Jungle, which exposed mountains of misbehavior within the meat industry. Harsh working conditions, exploited employees, and extremely unsanitary food. The book set off a firestorm around the country as people learned just how filthy and disease-ridden the meat industry was at the time. And yes, even our beloved hot dogs. Hot dogs and other meat products were filled with sawdust, dead rats, horse and dog meat, and all sorts of other unspeakable things that left people shocked. Public outcry led the US government to pass a law that made it illegal to mislabel meat products, that made sure meat was slaughtered and processed under strict guidelines that would keep all the food significantly safer and more sanitary. And the same went for hot dogs. The meat packers could no longer squeeze whatever leftovers they want into a casing and call them beef or pork hot dogs. Now they had to clearly label the ingredients like everything else. You might be tempted to think that because hot dog ingredients are clearly listed that they might not be so bad for you, but sadly, it's not so simple. The thing is, you might have to do a little more digging to really understand what's written on the label of a modern day hot dog to know what you're actually eating. A hot dog you'd buy from the supermarket is usually made of beef or pork, or sometimes turkey or chicken. And while those dogs are definitely made of those meats, it's important to note they're technically made of trimmings. What are trimmings, you ask? Well, it's a nice way to say all the discarded things left over after cutting up meat, like fat, tissue, organ bits, and skin to name a few. From there, the pile of stuff is cooked, ground into a paste, and mixed with other additives and spices to make it taste good. Finally, the meat paste is pumped into casings and cut into that classic shape, cooked one more time, then packaged for stores. This might sound kind of gross, and honestly, it kind of is. But it's important to point out that it's all above board, edible, and USDA approved. And if you love hot dogs, but all that pink paste makes you a little queasy, just look for all natural dogs. Any product labeled as all pork or all beef is gonna be the kind of muscle meat you're likely much more used to eating in steaks or other meals. And now that you know how the hot dogs are made, let's pull out the condiments, cause it's time to eat, if you dare. How do you digest food? The process of digestion doesn't start in your stomach. It actually starts in your mouth, even before you've taken your first bite. You see, saliva doesn't just make it easier for food to slide down your gullet. It also begins breaking down chemicals in the food, starting up the digestion process right there in your mouth. When you finally get a bite and sink your teeth into whatever it is you're eating, the saliva breaks down the food even more, making it easier to mash up and swallow. 
with the help of your tongue. All that chewed up food makes its way to the back of your throat. Once you swallow, the food leaves your mouth and enters the second section on its digestive journey, the esophagus. The esophagus is the long, stretchy tube behind your windpipe. Think of it a bit like a tunnel. The walls mm -hmm. of your esophagus are lined with muscles that squeeze the mushed up food down into your stomach. Inside the stomach is where digestion really kicks into high gear. Lots of us picture our stomach as a big sack half full of acidic liquid that dissolves away whatever we eat. But that's not quite right. Instead, think of your stomach a little bit like a natural blender full of acid. The walls of your stomach are lined with super strong muscles that ooze out acidic gastric juices that break down the food even more. They stretch and squeeze your stomach, churning up everything inside and breaking the food down into smaller and smaller bits. Once your stomach is done doing its digestive work, what's left of the food is ready to move on to the next stop in its journey, the small intestine. The name is a little bit misleading because your small intestine is anything but small. All stretched out in a line, it's actually over 20 feet long. That's about as long as a string of lights you'd put on a Christmas tree, all coiled together inside your belly. As the food mixture makes its way through 20 plus feet of twisting and turning intestine, digestion continues. As you might imagine, this is the longest part of the process. It can take up to four hours for food to make its way through your small intestine. During that time, the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder all produce special juices that help your body process the minerals, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats left in the food mix. Once the mixture is finally done making its way through the small intestine, what's left are just the parts of the mushed up food your body couldn't use. All that stuff goes right into the large intestine. The large intestine is wider than the small intestine, but nowhere near as long. Only about five feet if it was laid out in a line. While it moves through, Water is absorbed out of the food mix, making the waste less of a mushy mess and more of a harder mass. And then, of course, the digestive journey finally reaches its triumphant conclusion in the bathroom. A gross end to an all-around icky journey through your guts.